Good evening and welcome along to the Art of Direct and as part of the month-long Deloitte Ignite Festival here at the Royal Opera House. Tonight we're on the other side of performance with three wonderful, versatile directors from across film, TV and many other art forms in partnership with Directors UK. On my right, Mr David Yates, acclaimed British film director who guided well, of many other things, a Harry Potter juggernaut to its close and is now working on a new Tarzan film. <laughs> Next to David Theosharik, not only a very successful, hugely successful theatre director who's directed work at, well, probably most of the UK's most prestigious venues, uh, but also very successfully moved into TV directing. <laughs> And on my left, some of you may recognise him, it is Casper Holton, director of opera here at the Royal Opera House and a stage director in his own right. <laughs> so I guess I would like to start, if you don't mind, by, by getting your thoughts on <coughs> what a director does. <laughs> Thea. It's fascinating to me how the job has changed and how the answer to that question is different. But in essence, you are... I guess you're the captain of the ship and um, <clears throat> you have to lead a team of people. Um, you have to, in many ways, you have many different hats. So you also become a parent. Yes. So Diplomacy is, is a very is big. <laughs> okay. Is big. Kofi Annan is a huge uh, <laughs> idol of mine. <laughs> and Arsene Wenger is my other one. So oh, that's wow. the other thing. On opening night, you've been the most important person in the project. You are the leader, you're the director, you have to make all the judgment calls. You're the one people, everybody goes to. At the, in the last two weeks, if we're completely honest, when you direct a big opera, I'm sure with film as well, you know, it feels even a bit as if you're God. You know, you, you sit in the auditorium, you have a huge desk, lots of assistants and people around you. You can say, stop, bring on the court. You know, you, can tr you, you create a world. You're sometimes a slightly frustrated God, but still, you feel very powerful. Yeah. And then on opening night, you have to let it all go. And, and, and although you go backstage and you say, oh, you know, good luck, and please remember in the second act to turn around, you know, basically they want you to go away so they can do their job. And that's the dilemma. So directing is somewhere, I think, on a scale from being someone who helps other people grow. And then on the other scale, of course, there's the being the auteur, the one who dares say, let's go northeast this time. Let's, let's, I have this vision. Let's mm. interpret it this way. Let, this is what we're going to ultimately do, whether you then sell it to them or persuade them or manipulate them or what you do. It's, it's a weird function because it has both of those things in it. You're very, very powerful and ultimately you can do nothing. Does the bigger the production, David, mean that you have more to control or less to control? Actually, oddly, I think the bigger the production, it's all about the key people you work with. Yeah. So even though there may be hundreds of people involved, as long as you're working closely with some of those key creatives, your production designer, your composer, obviously the, the actors, then you get maximum. I, I mean, I think one of the things you have to do as a director is you really need to focus in on what will have the maximum impact in a production because there are so many things that you have to concentrate on so many relationships you have to manage it's about choosing where to put your time mm -hmm. which is always quite stretched and challenged and where you're going to put your focus and I think deciding what's going to really make a big difference to the end result and what isn't is <laughs> crucial but I always like um, f my, my philosophy is about empowerment ultimately it's about that huge group of people that you're working with across a whole spectrum, you know, from DOPs to operators, even the grip or the sound designer or your producer or the exec at the studio. Ultimately, it is about finding the right pattern of a relationship that will guide through what you want from the process to end up with the best film. And it's, it is managing relationships. And every single relationship, as you say, is fundamentally different. And so... Um, and imagine every day is different, isn't it? Because mm. it's not like you have a, well, tell me if I'm wrong, but it's not like you have a, like a, the day, I know you obviously have a shooting schedule and things like that, but you never quite know what's going to happen, I guess, in a way as well. Or is it, is it kind of, yeah. Or is it kind of planned to? When you're actually shooting something, it's fairly rigorously planned. But within that structure, 
you know, lots of things can go wrong. Actually, filmmaking is a process of fixing problems, <laughs> frankly, often, because there are so many things that can surprise you and take you, of course, a wee bit. And it's how you manage that and it's how, how you use those things that go wrong sometimes that get you to a really fun and interesting place. But, I mean, simply because certainly the, even, even the smaller bits of television I used to do, it, it is rigorously organised simply because of the amount of money that we burn mm. through in a single day. Yeah. You know, a, a single day shoot on the bigger films that I make is hundreds of thousands of dollars. So you ought to, it has yeah. to be organised. Mm. Otherwise, people get really frustrated that you're wasting stuff. Yeah. O on the other end, um, one of the other things that I would always say you, one has to be as a, as a director is a facilitator almost. So but particularly mm. when you're doing new work in the theatre, um, so you have your actors on the one hand and you have your playwright on the other and in one sense you are the least important person in the room because at the, the playwright for me is the most important person <clears throat> and the actors at the end of the day are going to be saying the writer's words and you just as Casper says you can't be there mm -hmm. they have to be able to do it by themselves equally the playwright won't be there but their words will be with them yeah and you are the person who has to guide those two things to, to be as magical as possible um, and in some ways that's when you sort of you lose your power in a funny way although that choice is says a lot I think about directors because there are certain directors who would never see themselves like that for them it's about being God from start to finish yeah uh, and it's about their vision and that's the most important thing <clears throat> So if they want to do a production of uh, Measure for Measure, they want to do it in a way that no one's ever done it before, and they don't care if it doesn't make sense necessarily because it wants to have a stamp on it, and that's the most important thing. Um, whereas others just kind of want to tell the story as the playwright, whether it's 600 years ago or written yesterday, uh, you know, uh, intended. Yeah. Um, just to quickly say, though, one of the things that I've learned having done the different sides of it is that there's often when you go into theatre in a day of rehearsal there are some directors who go in with no plan whatsoever mm -hmm. no plan and it's what comes out of that group of people in that moment how do you think your um, actors performers would describe you as a director do you think you have a style David I think I nurture and support and I'm generally very um, encouraging, and I never shout. They always say I'm very quiet, and I am very quiet, actually. I just, I feel, I feel it's a very exposed place to be as an mm. actor in front of the camera. And I, I think they need as much, and that's not to say that I'm not quite firm with some of them, I am. But ultimately, I want to be there to support, encourage, and open them up, let them feel safe. And I think, so they would probably say, yeah, David's very quiet, he knows exactly what he wants, but he doesn't shout about it. So I, ne I never... And when you do shout, the great thing is, if you're not a shouter, <laughs> when you do, that one time you do, it's like a hurricane. Everybody's freaked out. So, um, yeah. How I many that's... times have you shouted, do you think? Um, in, and at who? Um, <laughs> no, no, you don't usually, have to. It's usually my camera operator. No, only a couple of times, literally. Really? I do very, very, very rarely. I don't need to, honestly. No, 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 sure. Um, That's in the preparation then, isn't it? It's fact, you don't in need to. It's in the no, and also, it's, it's in the who nature. you choose to work yeah. with. Who you choose to work with. A crucial part of what we do is the cast, casting process. Not just in the actors, but the people you surround yourself with creatively. All those HODs, it's actually going through a process whereby you surround yourself with the right people. Mm. And if you surround yourself with the right people, you don't have to shout at them. <laughs> do you know? Because you've got the right people. But I imagine on the way up to this amazing career that you all have, you know, you're all, you're all hugely successful, but I imagine at the start you weren't in that position to be able to pick and choose, or, or, or can you? Is it that, is, is it, is it that where you, when, even when you're starting, you can handpick your crew and, and who you want, or, is, or does that take a little bit of, of kind of, you know... Um, I still chose all the people pretty much as yeah. I came up, yeah. I was very lucky. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I mean... Um, just remember the very first thing I ever, ever did um, was a piece of theatre and the, the first real relationship you have in theatre is with a designer. And the designer that I used was somebody who had been... I was an assistant on a show that she designed. And, you know, it took, in the moment, what felt like huge balls to ask her to come and do it with me. But she, but she did and, and it sort of grew from there. But, yeah, I've, I've always chosen... That's, 
it's just as important as the as the acting as mm -hmm. the actors. Sorry, um, the the casting of the people around you is yeah. everything. Would you agree? Uh, definitely. I mean, all major ideas for me come in conversations, particularly with the designer. Mm -hmm. I mean, in opera and theatre, the designer for me is a crucial person. Obviously, obviously, also with the conductor. But early on, it's early, it's often the designer. I can't have good ideas on my own. I need to do it when I talk to someone. Even if I end up coming up with the idea, it needs to be in a conversation. So it's super important. And you find a language with some people you trust, mm -hmm. you work with them over the years, you build up an understanding. And then, of course, eventually, sometimes you bring in a new, a new designer, work with someone, and it can be very refreshing. But it's, mm. it's extremely important, those relationships. Who are you directing for? So I'm directing for the audience. Obviously, without an audience, there would be no point. And I'm always nervous and keen and curious about how they read what I see and I'm actually I think quite humble about trying to find out what they I mean there's nothing better than when someone out of the blue sent you yesterday two days ago an old production of mine was revived in Copenhagen got a message on Facebook for someone I don't know who said I had to write your message and tell this was a fantastic evening and I was really so moved that's the best when someone in the audience says you moved me mm. you did something you opened this work to me but Having said that, I think when I'm in the rehearsal room or in the preparation, I need to forget about the audience. Because if I think about the audience too much when I work, it's just vanity. Mm -hmm. I, I want to be a success. I want people to love me. So in the rehearsal room, I really fight hard to not think about the audience, to not try and think about will they like this or be provoked by this or you know, get this, but to try and direct for me. Yeah. And then I try when I see my work being received to learn from how did they read that. And then the next time I go in the rehearsal room, hopefully my tools are a bit sharper in terms of if this is what I want to do, how to do it then. But it's a really fine balance because I do feel if I take the audience too much into the rehearsal room, I don't do it for the sake of the audience, I do it for the sake of my own vanity and that's never good. <laughs> David, what about you? Who do you direct for? For the audience, clearly. It's important that... Um, I mean, I, 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 what I love about storytelling is finding tr trying to find truth you know even even in a sort of landscape that might be quite fantastical you always look you're always looking for that human truth mm. ultimately and that's what i get very excited about um you know the movies i'm making at the moment they're sort of like they're very visual effects driven but the things that really excite me is when you do have a couple of actors in a room and you have a moment between them mm. that feels pure and truthful and the air shifts, and I can feel it, and the guy who's operating the camera can feel it, and I come out of that session feeling genuinely excited, whereas then we can be blowing up a God knows what else, or <laughs> having a wildebeest stampede going through a colonial town, you know, as 20,000 soldiers get off boats, and frankly, I couldn't give a monkeys because it's, it's just kind of spectacle. I, I love exploring what it is to be a human be being and to feel certain things. And if we can capture that expressively sometimes, hopefully. Um, so th that's what excites me fundamentally, is to find a truth in however fantastical a situation you can be exploring. Um, so fundamentally, it's, it's finding that truth and then seeing if the audience respond. Mm. You know? And sometimes the audience really surprises you and don't <coughs> doesn't get it at all <laughs> and sometimes it can be really beautiful when you sit in the theatre and you see 500 people feel the moment that you've explored and share that moment with you yeah. it's a really it's a really moving thing um, so yeah primarily primarily I, I want the audience to sort of engage and, and sort of be moved by what and involved and engaged in what I do yeah um, I, I, I think David put it very well. That's <laughs> what I, uh, that's what what I pursue too. But sort of two things stick out for me. One is, you know, the the answer we all have to give is the audience, right? But who is the audience? Because yeah. until you've done it, you mm. don't have an audience. Yeah. Uh, and even when you do a show, you know, for me it's at the National Theatre, or for you if it's at the Royal Opera House, there's a huge number of people who've already paid. <laughs> to be part of that so in one sense you kind of know who that's for but I would never I, 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 it wouldn't cross my mind however mad this might seem to go into a rehearsal and, and look at a moment and go well you know what we can't do it like that because the audience that we know will be coming to see it won't like that I mean you just for me it just doesn't even cross my mind mm -hmm. 
what's kind of thrilling is find you do the work as far as I'm concerned and the audience finds it and if it's good then hopefully you know they tell other people and more come to it um, and then you discover who your audience is and you know if you're lucky there are a few people who come and see but you know lots of things that you do and so when you do very varied things you get very, you know, I will have very, largely my mum and, uh, <laughs> but not my brother, for example. Um, uh, you know, and because you, you do very, you could do very varied things, so they can see one thing and really love it, and see another thing and not like it at all, or or just the thing that you happen to do is not the thing that you normally do, but it's their bag, and so they see that. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's kind of you don't know who that is. Um, but the, the, sorry, just one other thing, which is, goes back to the other thing that is the most important thing is that when I was in my drama school where I was mute. Um, drama school, drama club. All we did was impro. That's all she believed in, the teacher. Mm. And um, she would always say that the most important thing is to make it believable. That's all she ever really said, and that has stuck with me forever. And it made absolute sense to me. So we would be sent off in pairs, and we'd get up, and she'd give us the first line, and we would have you know five minutes where we'd have a huge row. Well, people always rowing, you know, because the first question was always, you know, how dare you ever say that to me, or whatever it was, you know. Uh, and then, and then they'd go, okay, uh, uh, Edith and Casper, we'd like to see yours, please. And so we would sit and watch. And every single time I would sit there, and either I would believe them or I didn't believe them. And if I didn't believe them, then I'm not involved. Mm -hmm. If I did believe them, it would move me in whichever way. Mm. And that is that feeling is what you what I strive for in every piece of work that I do. Can, can I yeah, just one thing? Because I think one, one interesting thing is like it's very good what you say, and it's true. You have the audience hasn't been there yet. Sometimes I get the feeling, which is not to be defensive, but when the audience sees the work, I think you sometimes assume, maybe I even do it when I'm an audience, that this is exactly what that you know, they would put this on to provoke me or to impress me or this is what they wanted to give me and they had this kind of opinion about why they and I hear sometimes when there's been controversy that people say oh you directors are so arrogant and actually I mean most directors I know are all full of doubts and questions all the time and not sure because of course what we experience is that you go you start somewhere and then you go forward mm. and you end up somewhere you've been on a search you've been on, you've made loads of calls but you didn't quite know how I, you would be astonished, I think, to find how much we don't know what it is until the audience is there. Mm -hmm. Only when the audience is there do we really understand how it reads and feels and what they... You, know, you often can be surprisingly completely out of touch with what people read or whether it's successful or not, for that matter. Yeah. And people, of course, read it backwards. They see the, pres the, the result and then make assumptions about why you did that. And so there's something much more, which is, again, not... I don't know, it doesn't change anything. But, but, but directing something is so much a journey which you don't always quite, or you never really know where it ends up. It, because it's so many different things that has to kind of turn and develop and grow. And some, you end up with something that you believe in, of course, and yeah. you, you've done honestly, but you don't really know what that is until it meets its audience. It's a very, very strange experience. Just before we wrap up, one quick question for you all. You talk about that connection that you make with the audience, but for a connection that you've had with a production and a, and a performance, is there a performance that you've directed, whether it be TV, film, theatre, that has stuck with you for whatever reason? But is there is, is, is a, a moment or a performance that you think about instantly when you think about something that's moved you. You know, you talk about that, David, about having that moment where you see that connection. Is there a specific performance from a pair of actors, an actor or a collection that is stuck with you that springs to mind? Casper? Um, <clears throat> it, it is true, that thing, that when you are in the rehearsal room and suddenly something happens that you will never forget. And when I did, directed The Ring Cycle, there was a moment in Valkyrie in the third act where where Wotan needs to let go of his daughter. And, and that, that, there was just something very special where we, where we knew we had hit, so that I really understand when you say something truthful. It was not naturalistically staged, mm -hmm. that's a weird thing, but it was, it was believable, it, was, it, was, it worked. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that, that, I'm very proud of that moment to this day. Brilliant. David, you want to? Uh, I, I, I did a, t a TV series called Sex Traffic, and mm -hmm. I, I cast in uh, a couple of, the main role in, Roma in Romania with this uh, actress, young actress called Anna, Mar Anna Maria Marenka. And she had only done theatre in Romania. And she was playing a very difficult, difficult role about a girl who's being trafficked. And um, 
she'd never really done much film and TV at all. Actually, she'd done nothing, really. And the minute she walked into the room, I just knew she had this quality, which was amazing. And anyway, she did a beautiful... Um, we put her through so many difficult situations and scenarios, and she dealt with it all with enormous dignity and grace and power, frankly. Um, and she won a BAFTA for that role, straight out of, you know, theatre. Um, and that, I, I remember that because I was so proud of what she did and um, how she sort of carried that role. And um, for someone who'd, you know, for someone whose first TV role it was. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Mm. Yeah. Um, oh, it's hard to choose, I'm privileged to say, but I think the one that I go back to every time is um, I did a production of a play called After the Dance at the National and um, I worked with an actress called Nancy Carroll, whom I'd never worked with before. <coughs> and there was this moment in the middle of the second act where she discovers that her husband is not in love with her anymore, but is instead in love with a much younger woman. <coughs> and this is set in the 30s, so in England when largely people didn't really talk to each other. Uh, certainly on an emotional <laughs> level. And there's a scene where she's, she's told this and she absolutely holds it together beautifully whilst with other people. <clears throat> and then she's left alone on stage just for a moment. And I staged it so that she had her back to the audience. And as the person that left the room, the door was right ahead of her, so the audience is behind. And every night she found that moment and it was completely true. And she would put her hand on like a little table um, to steady herself because as that door closed and she was left alone, she felt that pain every single night. And you could tell from the back of her that she was crying but in a way that she was never going to let anybody see it. And she held it and held it and held it. And now it sounds kind of funny, and I don't mean it funnily, but every night it got a little bit longer. <laughs> Not because she was milking it, but because she held it for longer and she felt it for longer. And the scene would end with somebody else coming in. She would hear a voice. And the way she would then turn to the audience and pull herself together. So we were completely sharing that moment with her, not whilst she was sad, but whilst she was pulling it together. And you could just, you read every beat of that on her face. And it was utterly extraordinary. And that was, the, it was right at the end of Act Two. And there were two um, intermissions. And I mean, people were, were weeping at the end of it, and it was kind of, we didn't really know we had that going on uh, during the rehearsals to that degree because she hadn't found it yet, because we were still working towards it. Mm. And as soon as the audience came together with the show, we began to really understand what the rhythms were. Mm. And she was incredibly brave, and she felt it, and she ran with it, and uh, I'm delighted to say she won every single award going because she deserved it, even though she was... She then died at the end of Act Two. So she wasn't even in Act Three, and she still won all the Best Actress Awards, which was <laughs> a really testament to her. And I'm you know, very proud to have gone with her on that, on that journey. I've got goosebumps. You're just describing mm. that as well. It's amazing. Casper, yeah. thank you so much for your time. David and Thea as well. It's been absolutely wonderful. And thank you, our lovely audience. Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs>